pray. Father, thank you for not withholding your only son for us. Thank you for being the God who provides, uh, Yahweh who provides, the great I am who is everything that his people need. We so much want to be our own providers. We want to have all the resources we need to meet all of our challenges and all of our needs. We want to have all of the answers and understand everything. We want to have all the strength we need. Sometimes we don't even want to sleep. We want to just keep solving everything. You don't let us. And you're the only one with all the resources. Gratefully, you're the great provider. So we humbly admit that we're the needy ones. You're the rich one with all the everything, every good thing. And we... Uh, knowing that that's your character, it's just a privilege to, to come and just simply pray to you and say, would you provide for us today? That, that means a hundred different things for a hundred different people sitting here right now. <laughs> but the great I am knows each of those things and is sufficient for each person in each life. And you also know the things that we need to be provided for us spiritually through your word this morning that we don't even know about. And so provide for us, shepherd our hearts. Pray in Jesus' name, amen. You want to make sure that you take that handout that's in your worship guide. It looks a little bit different this week because it's meant to lay a different direction. Uh, the front of it is the side that says the self-centered life. And uh, you'll see a chart down the middle of that with lots of room around it for you to take notes. Last week, we began our study of the sins against love. We started with Abraham, who asked his wife to lie so that everything would go well for him. Uh, we saw that the tables were turned on Abraham when his nephew Lot chose all the best land for himself without regard for what might be good for Abraham. So we're going to study several different types of sin in this series, but a theme that will underlie all of it is selfishness. So this morning, I want to just um, try to get the kind of the bird's eye view of what the Bible says about the self-centered life. And part of what we're going to see is that uh, self-centeredness is sin because it's not the way things are supposed to be. It's a small, fleeting, empty life. And God's purpose for you is much greater than to spend your days doing whatever feels good for you. Now, there's no way we can study in depth all these passages this morning as throughout this series, our goal is to get the big picture. But maybe it's, I, I just, I love that trying to get the big picture <laughs> because with many of these verses, they're familiar. They're the kind of verses you memorize. But it's very helpful for me to get them together and see it all at once. See the scope of what God says. So I enjoyed putting together this chart. This chart that I ended up putting in your handout here was just something I made for myself initially in my study. Um, you see there are two columns. Down the left column, you see the negative statements like don't just please yourself. And then down the right column, you have the positives like please your neighbor for his good uh, to build him up. The words on this chart are, uh, I don't know, maybe 90% quotes from the New American Standard, uh, something like that. Though I occasionally reworded things or used a word from another translation for clarity or uh, for brevity. And then you see that there are little numbers there on your chart that look like verse numbers. Um, and I added those just to make it easy to refer things on the chart so that I don't have to say, look at the right column, fifth row kind of thing this morning. I can just say, look at number 14. Uh, and then I left a lot of space there, hopefully for you to take notes. And let's start with the first column on the left. Let's just read down the list and then talk through this just kind of general overview. So we're going to read Numbers 1 through 9. Don't just please yourself. Don't seek your own good or your own profit. Love does not seek its own. Don't consider your life as something you must hold on to for yourself. Don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. Do nothing from selfishness. Do not merely pay close attention to what is in your own best interest. Don't close your heart against the brethren. And don't live to be served. All right, before we get into that, let's just address one of the possible confusions, and that is represented in the word just in number one, and the word merely 
in number seven. Don't just please yourself and don't merely pay close attention to what is in your own best interest. So uh, someone could ask, okay, so are we supposed to forget about our own interests completely and only worry about the interests of others? Or are we supposed to not only pay attention to our own interests, but also the interests of others? Which is it? And the answer is the Bible says both things. You can see that here in the list. You do need to care for yourself. And I think the biblical point is it's inevitable. You are physically, for example, going to try to get food or get sleep or get cleaned up sometimes. You will sometimes need to get medical care for yourself. Spiritually, you do need to try to care for yourself spiritually. You need to eat spiritual food each day and have spiritual relationships. And sometimes you might need to go to spiritual urgent care and get specific help. You need to care for your budget and your finances and take care of your house and your vehicle. And there is no such thing as a life that pays no attention to self-care. <laughs> it, it doesn't exist. Um, and so in that sense, the Bible can say, Okay, don't just take care of yourself. You're going to. It's kind of like Ephesians 5 says, husbands, love your wives as you already love your own bodies, right? You're going to. You already do, and in a sense, you need to. But don't just do that. Also take care of others. Uh, but, but because of our tendency to just do that, the Bible also sometimes says it with a really strong edge, and it just says, forget yourself. Don't live for yourself. Die to yourself. Lay down your life for other people, because that's what our flesh needs to hear because we tend to keep making it about about us, all right? So let's look at these in specific. Number one, don't just please yourself. Matthew Henry, uh, four centuries ago, wrote, we must not make it our business to gratify all the little appetites and desires of our own heart. Um, where was I with my children this week? Oh, I don't remember. Well, I know, I just, I know one example. Crystal was with the kids at the thrift store. And, oh, the thrift store is full of things to be wanted and had, just like any store, right? But especially the thrift store, because they're, they're cheap. And so she did not take her wallet into the thrift store with her so that the answer could just be consistently no. <laughs> I didn't even bring my wallet. So no, we can't get anything. And so if you picture a little child who just, who just wants everything they see, is there not some parallel to all of us in the way we live, just constantly wanting, 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 you know, everything that's presented around us. Um, and what's startling is that we live in a culture that makes self-happiness one of the greatest virtues. Follow your dreams. Be anything, you can be anything you want to be. Do whatever makes you happy. The modern hero is the person who is true to himself. Now, somehow even Donald Trump went past the line of people saying that about him. But there are many other horrific things people have done and said, and other people have said, way to be true to yourself, man. You say, really? Really? You abandoned your family and people patted you on the back and said, way to be true to yourself? What is that? But the idea is that if you do whatever will make you happy, that's like the highest virtue. And that is a lie because the self-centered life destroys shalom but it is also hollow. The world is lying to our children and teenagers and young adults and midlife crisis men and women and retirees, and it's telling all of them to live the self-centered life. Why does the world lie to them like that? Okay, we can answer that in two ways. We can answer that in the ultimate spiritual way that there's a God of this world who wants to condemn people to an eternity apart from God. That's part of the answer. More practically, in our culture, the answer is commercialism. If you aren't self-centered, you might not buy the latest video game or get the latest clothes or spend money for the fancy car or download the newest album or get the biggest RV. The world has to tell you to live for yourself so you'll spend the money uh, so that they can make the profit they want to make. <coughs> Together with that, tragically, our culture also teaches that love consists of blindly supporting anything anybody else does to pursue their own happiness. Love in our culture today simply means not judging someone else's pursuit of happiness. Love means, in the culture, live and let live. Folks, that is a puny definition of love. Really? 
Love only means you do what I want. You do what you want. I'll do what I want. I'll let you do whatever you want. You let me do whatever I want. That's love. Is love not action? Isn't love care? Isn't love sacrifice? Isn't love loyalty? Isn't love commitment? Isn't love pursuing somebody else's shalom at your expense? Really, love is just do whatever you want and I'll do whatever I want. So the point is that while culture tells us that it is a great virtue to pursue your own happiness, God says, don't just please yourself. To just please yourself is to live a shriveling little life. You have a much higher calling if we cheat and go from number one across to number 10 on your chart. Please your neighbor for his good to build him up. You've got a higher calling. All right, number two, don't seek your own good or your own profit. And that goes together with number 11 and number 13. Seek the good of your neighbor and seek his profit. But that requires a willingness to set aside your own good or your own profit. You can't be preoccupied with yourself. And then number three, 1 Corinthians 13 says, love does not seek its own. The New American Standard translation there is very uh, a very literal representation of the Greek text. Love does not seek its own. But that leaves us asking, its own what? Maybe we'd say love doesn't seek its own way or love doesn't seek its own preferences or its own priorities. But maybe it's even better to reword it into something like love is not self-serving, love is not self-seeking, or my favorite, love is not self-centered. Love is not self-centered. Number four, don't consider your life as something you must hold on to for yourself. That's Acts chapter 20, and Paul says that God has a course for him, and all that matters is finishing the course. It doesn't matter if he has a long life or a short one. He says this when they're cautioning him, don't go to Jerusalem, you're going to get killed there. And he says, listen, it doesn't matter to me whether I have a long life, a short one, a comfy life, a difficult one. All that matters is finishing God's course. We don't have to hold tightly to our own life as if we have to desperately keep it for ourselves as long as possible. You know, the whole health industry feeds into that desire. And I'm not saying you shouldn't be healthy, but there's a whole industry that feeds off of people's desire to hold on to life as long as they possibly can. And they sucker people into spending lots of money in the pursuit of that, you know? And you should seek to be healthy, that's fine. But you, you're goal in life is to finish the course, God's course for you. Number five, don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. All right, that might seem a little unrelated. Partly it's on here because of number 14, the rest of the verse, through love, serve one another. But, but here's the thing we need to understand about number five. In that passage in Galatians 5, Paul is reminding them that they are no longer under the bondage of the expectations of others. Do you know anything about the bondage of the expectations of others? Now, particularly, he's talking about the bondage of the law and the religious expectations of the Jews who were trying to pressure these Christians to keep obeying the law. But the principle applies more broadly. Christ sets you free from having to be controlled by anybody's expectations. God loves you, God forgives you, God welcomes you. Somebody else might be disappointed in you. You might not be able to meet up to their expectations. You're not a slave to their expectations any longer. You're free. But then Paul says, be careful that you don't then just start living a life to please yourself or particularly to please your flesh, to do whatever you feel like doing. So don't turn your freedom into an opportunity to center your life on yourself and do whatever your flesh feels like. Number six, do nothing from selfishness. Now that word there, selfishness, is a unique one with a fairly specific idea. You might want to write in uh, the, the key cross references James 3, verses 14 through 16. And there in James 3, it's translated selfish ambition. It's hard to find one English word for this, but we've got a phrase that nails it. It's the phrase, what's in it for me? Okay, that's, that's what this word means. Don't do anything from the perspective of what's in it for me. 
What am I going to get out of this? Paul says, don't do anything like that. You should never make any decisions based solely on the question, what's in it for me? That is not the way Christians live. Yet it's easy to think that way because we, um, you know, for example, we like to love those who love us, to love those who thank us, to love those who respect us, to love those who agree with us. We gravitate toward those people. We serve those people because there's something in it for us. And Paul says, don't do it because there's something in it for you. Do nothing out of what's in it for me. Look at the whole picture at the interests of others, at the interests of God. Number eight, don't close your heart against the brethren. Now, what I want to point out here is that we're going to come back to this text in number 21 and in another week. But what I want to point out this morning is that you can unintentionally close your heart against the brethren by a self-centered life. Closing your heart against other people can be an intentional thing. I see your need and I say, no, <laughs> I'm going to pretend like I didn't see that. I'm not going to help you. But closing your heart against other people can also simply be what happens when you turn your attention in on yourself and your concerns and you're not even aware of anybody else's concerns because you've just turned yourself in on you. A self-centered person doesn't even realize how he has closed his heart toward others in the process of pursuing his own interests. And then number nine, don't live to be served. Jesus said, Matthew 20, I didn't come to be served. He gave us an example of service that we should follow in his steps. Don't live to be served. Ever heard of an entitlement mentality? An entitlement mentality? We see that in social services. We see that in education. We see that many places. And you know, the primary place we see an entitlement mentality <laughs> is the human heart, right? We've all got it. It's lurking around. Other people ought to serve me. No, don't live to be served. Okay, we made it down the first column. Those are some tough calls. Those are some sober warnings. There are some things there we need to obey. But that column was never meant to stand on its own. We understand the first column best when we put it together with the second column. So let's read straight down 10 through 21 now. Please your neighbor for his good to build him up. Seek the good of your neighbor. Make yourself a slave for the spiritual good of others. Please all men and all things seeking their spiritual profit. Through love, serve one another. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Pay close attention to what is in the best interest of others. Share not only the gospel, but also your own life with others. Live to serve. Endure all things for the spiritual good of others. Spend and be spent for the souls of others. And lay down your life for the brethren, for the brothers and sisters. All right, start with number 10. Please your neighbor for his good to build him up. Now those phrases, for his good, to build him up are helpful because the word please might have you a little concerned. What if we actually just tried to please everyone else? To give them anything they want. Oh, what if my wife walked into the thrift store and just handed the kids the credit card? How would that go? Your students want no homework. Your children want only dessert at every meal. So you say, wait a second, how can God tell us to please everyone? And so Paul clarifies, listen, we're talking about pleasing them for their good, which means that which will build them up. Building him up in Romans 15 means building up his faith. In other places in the New Testament, it means building them up toward Christ-like. So this does not mean do anything that will make anybody else happy, but do what would be for their spiritual good, what would build them up in Christ. Same thing with number 11, seek the good of your neighbor. Number 12, make yourself a slave for the spiritual good of others. Number 13, please all men in all things seeking their spiritual profit. All right, let me make uh, th three comments on 11, 12, and 13. First of all, <coughs> I just clarified that please doesn't mean you do anything anybody else wants. But at the same time, that word keeps coming up. Um, and I, I looked pretty carefully at the, you know, the original Greek meaning of that word, please. And it means, please.
please. It means do what would make them happy. It means do what would be what they want. And so it's true that God doesn't mean do anything anybody wants, but let's also not overthink this too much. Let's, I think all of us could do a better job of paying attention to what would make other people happy. Just simply, right? Like whether it's what to do on vacation or what to watch on TV or what restaurant to go to or what the kids would enjoy doing with mom and dad. I think most of us realize we could do a better job of simply asking, what would make you happy? Let's do that. Isn't that the way shalom works? Doesn't that sound like shalom? So, yeah, you can't do everything everybody wants, but we could probably do a lot more of it. (laughs) But then the most important question is, what would be good for you? What would be for your spiritual blessing? Also, when we look at Numbers 11 through 13, really 10 through 13, remember that they go together with one and two and three in the other column. If you're going to please somebody else, you're going to have to not please yourself. Set aside your own good and profit. And that leads us then to the word slave in number 12. Yikes. That, that word's supposed to get your attention. Even if slavery was more common then, it still got their attention when Paul wrote this especially since he emphasized the freedom that we have in Christ. Paul was all about freedom. And then he turns around and says, now choose to make yourself a slave for the spiritual good of others. I think the best way to say it is probably be willing to act like a slave. What's a slave focused on? Whatever would please the master. They do that out of fear. We get to do it out of love. And that's number 14. Through love, serve one another. Serve, in number 14, is the slavery word again. We can use the serve word if we want, and Bible translators argue about which word better communicates the idea in our modern English context. But either way, the point is that you're living for someone else, for their good, for their benefit, instead of just for yourself. You're asking what would please you, what would build you up. Sure, I'll choose that. Number 15 is from Philippians 2. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. And also number 16, pay close attention to what is in the best interest of others. So now we're starting to talk about a whole different mindset. There in Philippians 2, Paul says, having yourselves the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. The attitude. It's a whole way of handling and thinking about life. Number 16 comes from Philippians 2, 4. The New American Standard uses the phrase, the phrase, look out for what's in the best interest of others. We could use the word concentrate on. I like the phrase, pay close attention to. What if everybody paid close attention to what's in the best interest of others? That's the way things are supposed to be. That's shalom. Everything would be right. That's the mindset our creator commands us to have. Number 17, share not only the gospel, but also your own life with others. I'm going to come back to that. Number 18, live to serve. That goes together with nine. Don't live to be served, but live to serve. Number 19, endure all things for the spiritual good of others. Endure. Endure. Self-centeredness is kind of easy, at least in the short term. It's the default. It's others-centeredness that requires endurance. Um, Or you quit, right? That's what endurance is. Endurance is not quitting. Maybe some of you can look back on some times in your life when you were paying close attention to the needs of others. When you were very focused on service but maybe your life circumstances changed. Can be something as simple as a move. Or maybe you got hurt. Or maybe you got weary. But today, you look at your life and it's different. Somehow you shifted from an others-centeredness to more of a self-centeredness. And maybe you didn't ever want that. You didn't ever intend for that to happen. But somehow, as life rolled along and things changed, now you you look back and you say, wait a second, something changed in my life. Maybe part of what happened is you, you, you struggled to endure when serving was hard. 
and you kind of defaulted back into a self-centered attitude. And maybe this morning God's saying, hey, (laughs) it's more blessed to give than to receive. Let's go back. Let's go back to that life of other-centeredness. Number 20, spend and be spent for the souls of others. I don't know why Paul says it in the active and the passive. Spend and be spent. But here's my guess. Some things when we serve, when we give for others, some things we choose. We spend. And other times it seems like we don't really have any choice. Somehow others just spend us. You know what I'm talking about? They're pulling the life out of us, it feels like. So I don't know if that's what Paul means, but that's my guess. Sometimes we actively spend and sometimes we just get spent by other people. But what does he say? See, I didn't have room on this chart to put all these verses. That would have been one big chart. But that means there's something really important missing from 2 Corinthians 12, 15. He says, I will very gladly spend and be spent. Actually, that verse is on the back of your handout. We'll get there in a minute. I will most gladly spend and be spent. Most gladly. That's an attitude that'll get you, get it, give endurance. So whether you're choosing to spend yourself for others or you feel like you're being spent, Paul says you can do it very gladly for the sake of their souls. Number 21, lay down your life for the, the brethren. The brethren means your brothers and sisters in Christ. Lay down your life. What does lay down your life mean? That's a nice euphemism for dying. Die. Die. But the idea of lay down your life is important because it means you you take the gift of your life and you say to other people here, you don't literally physically die. You take the gift of your time and your energy and your resources and your life and you say here, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. You lay down your life for others. Okay? We made it through the second column. And... uh, you've got about a dozen New Testament passages represented there on your chart that you could go and look up and study more yourself. Uh, Hopefully the two general ideas there are pretty clear. Love is not self-centered, but it pays close attention to the needs of others and is glad to to spend and be spent for them. All right, to the backside now. And two general conclusions. There's supposed to be three general conclusions to this sermon, but I did not want to rush number three, and so I cut it, and I'm going to try to figure out how to use it next week because it's really important, but I didn't want to just squeeze it in. So for now, two. Number one, the other's centered life is Christlikeness. Christianity at its core is about following Jesus, being his disciple being forgiven by him, changed by him. And he's the one who said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. He's the one who, after he washed the disciples' feet, said, I gave you an example that you should do as I did. He's the one who loved us and gave himself up for us. And so if you look in your chart at numbers 1 and 10, sorry, I'm making you flip back over, in that passage in Romans 15, don't please yourself, please your neighbor. That's Romans 15.1 and Romans 15.2. And what Romans 15.3 says is, even Christ didn't please himself. So this is Christ-likeness. And what that means is, when you come across Christ-likeness, when that's what we're talking about, that has two very important ramifications. Number one, it means it's God-honoring. This is not a shriveling little life. This is an eternally significant life that honors God. And number two, you're on the path with Jesus. When you're trying to endure in selfless service to others, Jesus is there with you. You're on his path because that is Christ-likeness. So number one, the other-centered life is Christ-likeness. Number two, the other-centered life meets both physical and spiritual needs. First of all, it addresses physical needs. Number 21 on your chart, 1 John 3, don't It's number 8 and 21. Don't close your heart, but lay down your life for the brethren. And what John is talking about there is meeting practical, physical needs. When Jesus said, I've given you an example that you should follow in my steps, he had just washed their feet, not metaphorically, not as 
I mean, it was a spiritual illustration, but he's not just talking about a spiritual illustration. He really was washing dirt off with water and a towel. And he said, I've given you an example to do is that you should follow my steps. So we want to be really careful that we don't overlook physical needs. You know, let's suppose somebody is worn down from being the caregiver for a family member and they tell you about that. Well, there's something that is very important that you can say to them right then that's also easy. And that is, I'll pray for you. Good. Please pray for them. But what if you went and spent your Saturday filling in for them so that they could go run errands and take a break? You would lose a Saturday. So which is easier, to lose a Saturday or to say the words, I'll pray for you? You see what I'm saying? We need to make sure that we don't, um, does this make sense? That we don't get so spiritual. <laughs> no, that's not quite what I'm trying to say. What am I trying to say? that we don't get so focused on only meeting spiritual needs that we are unwilling to spend ourselves for physical needs because we live in a physical world. Now, there's this very important spiritual reality, but every person whom you want to care for spiritually also lives a physical life with physical needs, and the Bible calls us to meet those needs. And so we don't, we want to see, I'm going to talk about the spiritual extensively in a minute, but we don't want to be just conveniently limit ourselves to that so that we don't have to go spend a whole Saturday helping cover for them so that they can go get a break that they need. That makes sense? The other-centered life meets physical and spiritual needs. But the flip side of that is, would you rather go spend your Saturday filling in for somebody like that so that they could do, go do what they need or would you rather walk with them for months at a time spiritually as they wrestle through their anger at God and their despair and they're skipping church and they're really struggling spiritually and they really need a friend who's going to try to be there with them as they work through a real spiritual crisis? Okay, now it gets a little harder, right? Now maybe, okay, I'll spend my Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> but don't make me try to figure out how to really invest in and care for a despairing, discouraged, angry at God person. That's too much. And so others' centeredness has to be willing to meet spiritual needs too. We've seen a whole bunch of references to spiritual needs in our list. If you could just flip back over for just a moment. Number 10, to build him up. Number 12, for the spiritual good. Number 13, their spiritual profit. Number 17, share the gospel. Number 19, for the spiritual good. Number 20, for the souls of others. Boy, there's a clear emphasis on the spiritual, isn't there? Meeting spiritual needs. So I want to focus on three verses that are here in your handout. Two of them are from our list. One is not. 2 Timothy 2, verse 10. So back onto the back side now. 2 Timothy 2, 10. Paul writes, For this reason... I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. Two things I love about that. First, the word endure shows up again. Self-centeredness is the easy path floating with the current. Others' centeredness swims upstream and takes endurance. But then what motivates the endurance? Paul's convinced that God chose these people. And if God chose these people, God's at work in these people. God's doing something. And so Paul sees it as a privilege to be involved in what God's doing that motivates his endurance. Then look at 2 Corinthians 12, 15 again. I will most gladly spend and be expended, spend and be spent for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? We've already talked about that first phrase, but look at the last phrase. With Corinth, Paul felt like the more he poured himself out for them, the less they responded with love. And that hurt. Anybody here know about that hurt? Anybody ever experienced that? Pouring yourself out for somebody else? Reminds me of Galatians 4. When Paul said, my, my children with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you, 
but I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone for I'm perplexed about you. <laughs> okay, he says two things there. He says spiritual care is like labor. And he says, secondly, honestly to them, I am perplexed about you. Okay? And back here he says, now why is it that when I love you more, I seem to get loved less? That's going to happen. And that kind of thing might be why some of you stop serving like you used to serve. Because you got hurt. You can't focus on the interests of others so that they will love you in return. You've got to do it for God's sake. What I actually wanted to point out here in 2 Corinthians 12, though, is that in the context, Paul is talking about spiritual parenting. He's thinking himself of himself like a spiritual father for these Corinthian believers. And that connects right into the next verse, 1 Thessalonians 2. But we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children, having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become very dear to us. Okay, so 2 Corinthians 12, Paul's thinking of being like a spiritual father. 1 Thessalonians 2, he's thinking about being like a spiritual mother. You see 1 Thessalonians 2, 8, the phrase, having so fond an affection for you, unusual Greek verb that's for the bond of parents and children. So he's talking in both passages about being a spiritual parent. What does it mean to be a spiritual parent? It means that you've played an important role in somebody else's salvation and or their spiritual growth. You've been a consistent, faithful, spiritual influence on them. Now, in Christianity over the last however long years, there's been a real resurgence of focus on the family. Oh, that was ironic. A resurgence of focus on the family. Uh, a lot of books, a lot of resources, a lot of seminars. There's been a huge emphasis on parenting in Christianity recently. And I, I would be crazy to criticize that because I think it's had some important uh, um, effects that have, been, that have been good. But I wonder if in the process we've lost some sight of the critical value of spiritual parenting. And I know that my perspective is limited, but from my limited perspective, I would suggest that our church is weak in spiritual parenting. Not weak in opportunities for it, because they abound. Now, I'm not pointing fingers at you, because if this is an area of weakness in our church, I'm responsible for it, okay? And it will be my number one area of focus during work sabbatical at the end of the year. But I am concerned that our church is in great need of more mature believers who are actively investing in the spiritual growth of others over time. And so can I ask you to consider what kind of spiritual parenting you are doing? Because it's something everybody can do. At any stage in your following of Jesus, there are people behind you in a sense. Maybe that's, if you just got saved, maybe that's people who aren't saved yet, right? And you need to jump right into their lives. Or if you've been saved 20 years, there are people behind you. But there are also always some people ahead of you too who've been where you haven't been yet, who've learned some things you haven't learned yet. They don't have to be older than you or have been a Christian longer. They've just grown more. They've matured more. Maybe they are older than you. And so at any point in your following of Jesus, you need to be both investing one direction and receiving that investment from the other direction. You follow what I'm saying? Everybody needs to be investing in others and being invested in spiritually yourself. Let me point out one more thing from 1 Thessalonians 2, 8. We, middle of the verse, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. All right, that's the word lives is the word we'd often translate soul. It can refer to your time. It can refer to your energy. It can refer to your health. We were willing to give you not only the gospel, but also our time, our energy, our health. But the commentary suggests that Paul's words probably go even beyond that to refer to his willingness to, 
to have close personal involvement rather than remaining aloof from the struggles of others. Close personal involvement. And again, our church family needs to continue growing in our willingness to have close personal involvement with others, even when or especially when they're struggling spiritually. We have to, have to become a church family with the maturity that does not run away from spiritual struggles, but runs to it. You follow me? I, I understand that it's easiest to run away. This is my week as a pastor, right? Check the email, want to run away. Look at the voicemail, want to run away. Head to a meeting, want to run away instead. I get that. But God calls us as an entire church family to not just give the gospel to each other, but our own lives. Are you willing to invest like that in other people? Even when they're struggling, even when it's hard, even when it's confusing, even when it's long term, even when it does take your time, your energy, and your health? If as a church family, we had that movement toward people who are struggling and that long-term track record of consistency in investing in people's lives, in spiritual parenting with one another, that would be a profound example of what it means to, to live an others-centered instead of a self-centered life. All right. There's a point three that's supposed to go right there, but we'll get it next week. Okay, so as you go this morning, please don't think that the biggest point of the message is that you should let your wife pick the restaurant for church today. I mean, after church today for lunch. All right? Please don't go saying, okay, fine, you choose where we're going, even though I don't like whatever it is. Okay? Don't go thinking that the big point of this was you let somebody else pick the football game to watch this afternoon. Because while those things are true, even non-Christians do that kind of stuff sometimes. They say, sure, you have your way. You choose. I'll let you do it. God does call us to that. And we could use more of that. But he's calling you to more than that. He's calling you to very gladly spend and be spent for other people's spiritual good. He's calling you to be willing to give not only the gospel, but your own life. That's the call that we've got to hear from him. Father, shape us into the image of Christ. Change us to be like him. Honor yourself by our endurance in an others-centered life. Grow in our church a depth of spiritual parenting that might reach into the needs of each person and provide the kind of care that reflects your care for us. Mature us, Lord, in our willingness to give our own lives for the spiritual good of others. We need to keep growing. We've got a shepherd to guide us. We have the spirit in us. So we look with anticipation toward the growth you're going to produce as we continue in this series. But today, would you give us the attitude, the desire, the heart that wants to turn away from self-centeredness, would you grant to us that? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.